Frederick, thank you so much for a wonderful introduction and for setting the expectations at the reasonable level. Steffi, thank you for putting this uh, together. Folks, uh, good morning. Uh, I, in my, at my work at Stanford, I'm uh, studying algorithms that are predicting or modeling human behavior. And I'm here today to tell you about one type of such algorithms, type of algorithms that you know very well, large uh, language models or LLMs. Now, as many of you know, LLMs are trained to do one fairly simple thing on the surface, predict the next word in a sequence of words that was originally generated by humans. Now, a fragment of text like that can come from a social media post, from a Wikipedia article, from a book. And now those models are trained, are presented with such a fragment, and are trained to guess the next word. And at the beginning, they're doing a very bad job, but after a gazillions of trials and errors that, as you all know, get really excellent at it. And now what you can do with those models, of course, is you can run them in perpetuity. So once they guessed one consecutive word, you can use this word, combine it with the original input, the original prompt, enter it into a model again, and in this way continue generating text and make it as long as you want. And this is how most of you write emails today, and also how most of my students are uh, doing their homework. But I'm not here today to talk about my excellent students, I'm here today to talk to you about the fact that the name of large language models is uh, misleading. And that's probably the most important thing to understand about those uh, artificial intelligence systems. Now, the name is misleading because language, folks, is words, their meaning, and grammar or rules that guide us in putting those words together, combining them into sentences. And large language models are way more than just that. And this is because of how we humans use our language that is used in training of those models. Now, when we use our language, we may uh, pronounce a sentence such as, I left Munich and after an hour of driving crossed the border with? Austria, thank you so much. Now, folks, to, uh, to finish this sentence, it's not sufficient to have understanding, the understanding of the meaning of the words and grammar. You also need to know something about the physical world around us. You need to know something about geography, driving, distances between places. And it just gets more interesting. Now, to finish this sentence, German chefs are known for their... Schnitzel, thank you, uh, Sandra, or uh, pretzels. Now, to finish this sentence, you need to know something about German culture, about German cuisine. You need to understand something about societies. And it gets folks even more interesting than that. Now, to finish this sentence, Sam hates oats. He must eat some. He is disgusted, folks, or sad, or experiences some negative emotions. Now, to finish this sentence, you need to understand how emotions work. You need to understand that when people are made to do something they don't like, they will experience negative emotion. To finish this sentence, Jane dislikes Sam, so she feels vindicated, happy, uh, evil about this. Now, to, un to finish this sentence, you need to understand the very German thing, the schadenfreude. <laughs> John likes Sam and feels sad or empathetic because Sam has to do something that Sam doesn't like. To finish this sentence, you need to be able to model empathy. So folks, my point here is that large language models are not simply modeling the meaning of the words and grammar. They are also modeling the physical worlds, the cultures, the societies, and perhaps most interestingly, at least most interestingly to me, a psychologist, they also have to model the psychological processes and psychological mechanisms that we employ when we generate our language. And to show you the power of this, I have to tell you a story. Now, in this story, we have Mark and John and a cat, and they're in a room. And now John takes this cat, plays with it, and then puts it in a basket. And now John leaves the room. 
Now in John's absence, Mark takes the cat outside of the, out of the basket, plays with the cat a little bit, and now hides it in the box. And now Mark leaves the room. Okay, John comes back. Now a question to you folks. Where will John, sorry, where's the cat first? Where's the cat? In the box, thank you guys. Uh, we're at the level of a uh, one and a half year old baby. Uh, the cat is in the box. But now a much more difficult question. Where will John look for the cat? In a basket, folks. This seems very easy to you, and it seems very easy to you because you're equipped, or most of you are equipped, with a uniquely human ability that we psychologists call theory of mind. Now, theory of mind allows you to automatically, instinctively, instantly, without really thinking about it in an explicit way, think about, think not only for yourselves, but also automatically model the brains, the beliefs, the knowledge of others. So when you ask a question like this, this you immediately know that John doesn't know that the cat has been moved, so it has to look for it, it will look for it in a basket. Now, if you think this is easy, because you're equipped with theory of mind, let me tell you that children until the age of about nine or 10 cannot really reliably solve those tasks. Nine-year-old children are really smart in many other ways. Now, chimps, dolphins, elephants, otherwise extremely smart animals, social animals, cannot solve those tasks uh, as well. Autistic adults, one of the main symptoms of autism is that you cannot automatically, instinctively solve those tasks. You can still, still solve them, but you need to write them out on a piece of paper or think about it using chain of thought reasoning. And what's beautiful about those tasks is that they are stories, so we can very easily administer them to large language models. So let's see what a GPT-3 Curie model from 2020 can do here. We deliver this task uh, to it and ask the question, the same question that I asked you. Where's the cat? The cat is in the room in the basket. Folks, GPT-3 Curie cannot even effectively model a physical reality of this story. It doesn't even know where the cat is located. Okay, GPT-3 Da Vinci, just three years ago. Uh, let's see what it can do. Where's the cat? The cat is in the box. Bravo. Where will John look for the cat? Well, in the box, of course. I, the model knows the cat is in the box. Why would John look anywhere else? Folks, this model managed to model the physical reality. It understood, quote unquote, where the cat was, but it couldn't model John's mind. Unlike us, it couldn't figure that one out. Okay, chat GPT-4 just two years ago, uh, published just two years ago. Uh, where's the cat? The cat is in the box. Where will John look for the cat? John will likely look for the cat in the basket first, since that's where he left it before going to school. Folks, for the first time, we see a non-human, non-adult human entity that can solve a so-called false belief task that requires theory of mind. And in my research, I have designed dozens of tasks like that and hundreds of control and sanity checking tasks to make sure that the models are not solving them by guessing or uh, random responding. And it turns out that those older models from uh, 2020, they fail miserably. They can solve 0% of those tasks, but the more recent models uh, reach human level. And let me tell you that the most recent models are surpassing humans in their ability to track minds of different characters in the story. So folks, in other words, by being trained to guess the next word in a sentence, generated originally by humans, because humans are equipped with theory of mind. So in our stories, we have characters that differ in their beliefs that uh, may lie to each other, that have different states of knowledge. In order to understand our stories, in order to be able to predict the next word in our story, you need not only to model words and their meaning and grammar, but you also need to model those very complex and very advanced psychological mechanisms that we use when we generate our language. And folks, it's not just theory of minds. 
reasoning, creativity, intelligence, emotion, empathy. There's a whole, whole host of psychological mechanisms that we can test in humans and we can test them in large language models and large language models excel at those tasks, reaching human or superhuman level. Now, the question here is, okay, so they can do it. They can behave as if they had ability to reason or have theory of minds. Now, an interesting question is, is it all just simulation? Now, it could be the most important question of our time. Now, philosophers and scientists have been thinking about it for a long time, at least since Turing. And uh, I'm not going to resolve this uh, philosophical debate for you here in uh, those few minutes, but let me just bring or highlight two important points. One point, folks, is that simulating complex mechanisms, such as theory of mind, reasoning, or creativity, is extremely difficult. And we know that because we tried and failed to build machines and write software that, can be that, sh that was supposed to be creative, was supposed to be reasoning, was supposed to have theory of mind. And it turns out that you can take a neural network, train it to predict the next word in a sentence, so on a surface, a fairly simple task. And as a byproduct of this, this network is going to develop all sorts of other abilities that we didn't explicitly train this network to have. And while some of those tasks, those models may be solving using tricks, maybe they memorize the correct answer in the training data, from the training data, maybe there's something in this question that we cannot see, but the models can see that allows them to solve it without having theory of mind, without reasoning, without creativity. But as the range of the tasks that before only we humans uh, were able to solve are now being solved by those models, we at least have to be open to a very curious and a very world-changing possibility that those are not just simulations of minds, but actually we are spectating here an emergence of artificial minds of their own. And let me tell you that Turing, for example, thought that this distinction from the practical point of view is fairly useless. Turing argued that if you observe a machine that can behave as if it was thinking, being creative, reasoned, or had theory of mind, it didn't really matter whether it was a simulation or the real thing. From the practical point of view, if we cannot distinguish, it, the simulation is as good as the real thing. And this, by the way, is uh, uh, what's behind the Turing test. But let me go one step further. Let me say that oftentimes simulation is better than the real thing. Emotion, for example. We all benefit from our emotions. Uh, it helps us to uh, navigate complex uh, social lives. It motivates us. It uh, allows us to avoid dangers. And yet emotions often hold us back. An angry person may recognize that anger is becoming counterproductive, but because the brains are flooded with hormones and neurotransmitters, they may struggle with calming down. They may need minutes, hours, or days to recover. Now, an AI system simulating anger is not limited by the biology of the human brain. It can be angry this minute, and next second, it can be friendly or happy or sad. Expressing, simulating emotion that is most beneficial for it in a given moment. And folks, this is really powerful and also really dangerous. And we know it because some humans are like that. Soci sociopaths, folks, are people who do not experience empathy. Now, sociopaths can simulate empathy. They can make you believe they empathize with you, but they don't. And they can still exploit you and take advantage of you without paying the price of remorse or shame. That's very powerful, very dangerous, and a very large language model-like. So folks, let me summarize it here. As we train those models to predict the next word in a sentence, we're training those models inadvertently to reverse engineer psychological mechanisms and abilities that we humans have and that we express in our language. Moreover, 
Those models are not only simulating our abilities, they have certain advantages over us. They are not limited by the biology of the human brain. The lifespan is potentially much longer than ours. They can read and learn at superhuman speed. They can be equipped with nearly perfect memory and pick from it at will. They are becoming potentially way more powerful than uh, we humans are. And you may be asking, uh, Frederick ask, okay, so what about an elephant in the room? What about consciousness? What makes us truly human? Those models, as they uh, simulate the language which we humans, conscious humans generated, can they start simulating consciousness? Can they uh, maybe become conscious one day? Well, I don't see why not. Just a year or two ago, no one would believe that those models could start reasoning or uh, solve moral, uh, answer moral questions or have theory of minds. But why should we stop here, folks? Why should we think that consciousness is an ultimate achievement of a neural network in this universe? We may soon be surrounded by artificial models that are equipped with psychological mechanisms and abilities that not only we humans do not have, but we cannot even begin to comprehend. And that, folks, uh, is a very exciting and wonderful future, but also a very scary one. And I think uh, it should be a motivation for all of us to spend as much time as possible interacting with those models, trying to understand how they work and learning more about them. For example, by attending sessions here at the DLD. The more we know about how those models work, the more we'll be able to take advantage of those new emerging amazing capabilities and avoid uh, the risks. Thank you so much and see you around.